Hello, this is Paul the Oaken Knight, and today I'm going to be presenting the December 1941 turn for Tetsuya Nakamura's Fire in the Sky, the Great Pacific War 1941 to 1945. Today we will be using the new version of the game published by Phalanx. Here we see the map set up for the start of the campaign game beginning December 1941. We will be playing through the Japanese player turn of turn one, so you guys can see how that all-important turn unfolds. When you're done, you should have an idea of how the game works and how you can approach it for yourself. Before we begin, let's take a quick look at the map to see, uh, to see what the setup is like, so you guys have an idea of what we're dealing with here. We have all of the units set up on their entry track according to the turn of entry. On the map itself, we have Singapore, and here we have Saigon with lots of air units, Singapore having the Prince of Wales and the Repulse and that group of naval units, as well as a big land unit. Some land units back here in India for the British Commonwealth. We have the Dutch over here in uh, Surabaya. Notice that Surabaya, Brunei, and... Singapore are the three oil hexes which, from which all of Japan's oil comes from for the whole campaign. Major Japanese group in Hainan, large battleship group, and a large uh, land unit as well. In Formosa, we have a group getting ready to jump into the Philippines, as well as some units already pre uh, forward positioned in Truk and Palau. Likewise, some units in the Marshalls and Iwo Jima, and the bulk of the forces for Japan are back in the home islands. For the United States, we've got the large group in Pearl Harbor. We have a group of uh, one carrier group that is kind of uh, randomly placed uh, once we get into the game a little bit. Personally, I don't like that. It can do things like have them show up at Wake Island, have them show up at Pearl Harbor. I would rather play it historically and have them show up someplace that doesn't matter. Four times out of six, that's what's going to happen. But since I want to play a historical game, I'm not going to roll that die. I'm going to just have them do that and not worry about it. All of the status markers are set up in their appropriate places on the 60-point the track that is printed onto the, right onto the game map. What we see here is the Japanese transport points that they use to do their moves. Their oil points start at full capacity at 60. And the number of merchantmen which is used to generate the transport points for a following turn. Right now it's set at the maximum which is 60. As the game goes on this will diminish and as it diminishes the starting point for the Japanese transport points will go down turn by turn until the end of the game. The uh, counter is actually double size as probably one of the few historical artifacts from the previous version of the game. Each time the, the uh, merchantmen take a hit, it goes down by two. So instead of going from 60 to 59, it goes from 60 to 58 to 56 and so forth. And the oversized counter is there to remind you of that. Transport points are generated new at the start of every turn so any unused transport points are lost. All the points, however, are not lost. They're retained until they are used. The sequence of play begins with the Japanese half of the turn. The first phase of each turn is the economic phase. Depending on which uh, player is the phasing player, different actions will occur. For the Japanese, the first thing they would do is to pay to transport all oil from the Japanese uh, to the Japanese mainland. So for every oil hex that they own, they would generate eight oil points. They would have to pay eight transport points to transfer eight oil points. So potentially they need to reserve up to 24 transport points from the prior turn to have points to move the oil for the current turn. So some measure of planning ahead is required. The second part of the Japanese economic phase is to pay to move Japanese transports to the Japanese convoy escort box. Now 
Once they're there, they, can, they stay there unless you pay again to remove them. It costs two transport points to pick a destroyer up anywhere from the map and plunk it into the Japanese convoy escort box. So I have paid two transport points to remove one destroyer from the Formosa group and place it in the Japanese convoy escort box. Uh, it's the destroyers that are in the Japanese convoy escort box that get to try to protect Japanese convoys and therefore protect their merchantmen. The next phase is the reinforcement phase. And notice how the rule citations are right there for you to look up should you need to refresh yourself on what exactly happens during each phase. During the reinforcement phase, players receive their reinforcements from the turn track, which may include damage units that are now repaired re-entering the game. For the Japanese player, damaged aircraft carriers return without any aircraft. Instead, one of two things happens. They get placed in the carriers without planes box, which is a really unhappy place for an aircraft carrier to go, kind of like purgatory. or if sufficient planes are in the naval aviation box, the Japanese player may, at their discretion, but they don't have to, replenish the aircraft that are on the aircraft carrier and get it back in the game. Note that they don't have to do this because, let's say they have a, a carrier that's not so good and they got another one coming in, uh, say, in a turn that's better and they expect to have sufficient trained up aircraft for naval aviation. They may withhold the not-so-good aircraft carrier so that the better one can actually enter the game in a turn or two. Only Japanese aircraft carriers that have been damaged have this problem. Newly arriving aircraft carriers that are right off the ship dock come with fully equipped air groups and do not have to take planes from the naval aviation box. Also during the reinforcement phase, the phasing player sets their submarine points back up to their limit so in this case the limit is two so that were the uh, Japanese down below their maximum of two sub points it would go right back up to two its full value notice that how the Americans on turn one they have two sub points beginning turn six go up to four points and at turn ten they go up to six points and so forth all the way up to eight points on turn fourteen that and some dyro modifiers make the American submarines a truly fearsome force as time goes on, but not in the beginning. So while neither side has used any submarine points, uh, the phasing player also gets to replenish their transport points. In the case of the Japanese, it goes up to their merchant value. So uh, those two points that we spent to move the destroyer up to the convoy escort box, get replenished and since our maximum is 60 currently it goes up to 60. And the final thing that can be done during the reinforcement phase is to pay for replenishment counters. And what replenishment counters do is to build up a damaged ground unit. So this guy could bring a four point unit that is damaged goes down to a two and this is a two point value so it could rebuild the two point unit up to a four. Note that you may not combine multiple replacement counters to build up a bigger unit. You have to buy a bigger replacement counter. And finally, if this were the uh, allied phase, but we'll throw this in just for grins, uh, is that units that are in the West Coast holding box or the British analogous one can move their units to Pearl Harbor. Likewise, the British can move their units to Bombay at no cost. The next phase of the game is the first deployment phase, which is where units are positioned forward, not, not getting into contact with the enemy, but being positioned from, say, backward bases to bases that are more forward so that they can do operations. In the deployment phase, units do one of two things. They either do C deployment or one hex deployment. One hex deployment is pretty much what it sounds. Units, say in Cure, can move to Okinawa at no cost. That is true for the for the sea units. It is also true for the air units. But for a land unit to be able to move one hex at no cost, it must have a land connection. Land connections are shown on the map by the skinny white line. So, for example, a land unit in Ley could do a one hex deployment into Hollandia because of this skinny white line. Basically, it looks like a trail. 
uh, it cannot go from say from say truck to Palau because those are islands there is no land connection between them that is only for the land units air units and naval units can do that one hex deployment over the water now anything further than one hex requires sea deployment and that is true for all of land sea and air to do sea deployment requires transport points and the number of transport points depends on two things it depends on the uh, the transport cost of the unit which is going to be the black number uh, say out there on the land units sea unit and likewise air unit so you can see what the cost is going to be that cost is for one to four hexes one to four hexes anything farther than that is going to cost an additional increment of whatever the base number is. So if you are moving, say, six hexes, you have to be able to move to a base four hexes away or less, and then you continue on with a second move, and once you go above four, you have to pay an additional increment of cost. So a two-point unit moving eight hexes would cost four points. Likewise, one of these big honking infantry units, these eight-point units, such as this guy here, Moving him four hexes is, uh, over C is going to cost eight points. And moving him farther than that, well, moving him five to eight uh, is going to cost 16. Moving you know, farther the next four increment is going to cost 24. Remember, you only have, the Japanese only have 60 points. So moving this guy even, say, uh, up to eight hexes is a large investment of transport points for the turn. So let's pan around and take a look at what I think uh, I want to do on this all-important first Japanese move. Well, clearly, Pearl Harbor is going to be on the hit list. Wake Island is going to be on the hit list. The Gilbers, it's kind of a gimme. Nobody's there, and I will take it. I like a strong attack from Hollandia through Rabaul. And the attack in Ley is particularly important because I like to put a lot of pressure on Port Moresby as early as possible in the game. In that sense, I think the Japanese had the right idea. They just didn't follow through with it after they were repulsed in their first attack. Of course, the Philippines. And we've got Brunei to get one of those oil hexes. We're not going to get them all. Actually, that, I think that's the only one we are going to get on the first turn, but at least it starts getting, it starts getting the oil flowing. And that's an important thing to get started. And we're going to go into Bangkok. Now, we may do more if I see points are available, but I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. I think that this is about what you've got. Much, much more than this, and I think you're stretching. Notice things that I did not attack, like Leyte. For one reason, one reason I don't attack Leyte is because it's a gimme. I mean, you can attack it at any time. There's, there's, the there'll be turn a, a turn or two for now is just as good as now, because no Americans are going to show up there. They can't get there. And over here, I think attacking the Dutch is kind of a stretch for turn one. Remember, this is December 41. Uh, the, the tax over here didn't develop till a month or two later. And likewise, Singapore. Now, you don't want to let Singapore go too long because there are penalties. There are penalties for not having that place by turn four. You start losing victory points each and every turn. So you might get away with it for a turn, but beyond that, uh, you're probably going to lose the game uh, or you have a much tougher time. Now, let's talk about winning the game for a second. The game has victory points that are based on the bases. Uh, they're one-point bases, most of them. There are some three points, like here. It's the number of stars that are printed on the hex. The game starts at 20 victory points, which is basically a draw. Okay? If the Japanese ever get up to 40 points, it's an automatic victory. So in that terms, I think about it as the short game, winning the short game. If the Japanese can get themselves up to 40 points, game over. Likewise, if the Americans end a turn with 19 or fewer points, game over. So the game's 16 turns, but it doesn't have to go 16 turns. And a lot of times when the Japanese win, it's going to be uh, a quick win. 
okay, rather than a long grinding win. The other way for the Japanese to win is to play out all 16 turns and have the final point tally uh, based on the onboard presence and any pluses or minuses that happen during the game uh, for things like not capturing, uh, not capturing Singapore on time or on the positive side, cutting the lifeline to, to Australia. Cutting the lifeline to Australia is a really good thing. For the uh, for the Japanese. Okay, so obviously, as the Japanese, we want to play for the the quick win, and that can happen. I've seen it happen as late as about turn ten. More commonly, say turn six, something like that, before the Americans really start going. But that is what the Japanese are hoping for. Before we go farther, let's talk about the white elephant in the room. I did not mark. Guadalcanal. There's reasons for this. One, a main one is that it's not eligible to be invaded. To be eligible to be invaded, there has to be a land unit that is in a friendly base within four hexes of its target. Okay, we've got that. That's not a problem. We got units in Palau, we got units in truck. It's not an issue. However, the second requirement is that there also has to be a friendly base within two of the base you intend to invade. That we do not have. Once we have Rabal, then in the following turn we can go after Guadalcanal, but we can't do it from the get-go. There is no friendly base within two hexes of Guadalcanal. Having said that, I have decided to call off the invasion of Hollandia. I thought it was kind of a bridge too far, and it's such an easy hex to take in a future turn. Since we're going to take Ley, we can have a land, we have a land uh, path here. We can just walk there for free. With, a, with an extra land unit whenever we want. There's not going to be anything in the way of opposition there for a long time to come, so I'm not worried about it. It's better to go ahead and be big where we need to be big rather than try to do too much on the first turn. The first deployment we want to do is to take the 15th Army out of Saigon and move it to Bangkok. Now, this is going to be a free move because one hex deployments are free move. We're eligible to do it because we have the land path that we can follow from this hex to that hex. It is legal to go ahead and walk into enemy occupied hexes or vacant hexes or enemy owned hexes. Uh, what you can't do is leave an enemy occupied or owned hex and continue walking on through to another one. So basically they're not, they're not wanting you to go ahead and have guerrilla warfare break, off, break out across Southeast Asia. You have to take care of the guys in the hex you're in before you can move on. But here we're in an owned hex, and we're walking into a vacant, unowned hex, and that's not a problem. So this move will be free. And now we are looking at Japan, and I want to do two more, two more single hex deployment moves uh, just to get ourselves positioned for the future. Uh, we're going to move the battleship Hiai to Okinawa. And we're going to move the 43rd Division to the western part of Japan. Okay, those were all free. Those were all one hex deployments. The naval and the, uh, the naval movements were allowed across the water because boats are boats. Uh, the land ones were allowed because they were walking over a land path, both in Japan and over to Bangkok. Air units can also go a single hex because uh, they can fly. <laughs> uh, but to go any farther than that, they have to go across the water with a, with a more amphibious sort of movement. Next, we want to take the 38th Division, as well as a couple naval units, and deploy them from Japan over to the Marianas Islands. The purpose of this move is to have them form up as an invasion group uh, for the operations phase, which is going to come in a short bit. Remember that amphibious invasions have to originate within four hexes of their targets. So uh, moving, uh, deploying these units forward will allow us to go ahead and do that. However, this move is not free because it was not uh, a one hex uh, free move. So we see the, the, the CA, the heavy cruiser, has got a transport value of two, the destroyer one, and the 38th division Four. So we were going to go ahead and, and uh, reduce our transport capacity by well, seven points. So moving over to the track, we see we have 60 points, and we're going to move it down to 53. And back to Japan for another move, where we want to move the uh, 
Issei, uh, the Issei Battleship Group from Kure, Japan, down to Pelau to join up. We want to beef up that, that stack for the operations that are coming. That is going to be a, a four-point move because he's got, he's got, it takes four transport points to move this guy to, to his uh, destination. And now the Issei is in Pelau. And we pay the four transport points. Now, in the example I've shown so far, we've done the single hex movement for the, uh, during the deployment phase. And I did a, a single leg move for uh, uh, various ships and, and ground units. Now, by that I mean you pay the transport points, you go from friendly base to, to friendly base, within four hexes of the original base where you started from. Uh, but you can also chain these together. As long as you don't hit an air zone of control, which is just like uh, in standard hex battle games, you know, land battle games, you got, you got a zone of control around the unit. So if you had a air unit here, the air zone of control would be all the hexes around it. Here's one here, it's all the hexes around it. That stops uh, deployment. In fact, uh, you, since you can't end up in the middle of the water, uh, let's, let's say if this was a, that's an American unit, if the Japanese owned Ellis, they could not, if, if they had to go here, that would stop. They couldn't do it. Now they can come in other ways, so it's okay, but that's how it works. It stops as soon as you hit an air zoc. Now, the important thing to know is that these can chain together. So, for example, this is how you get the Americans in the war in the, in the Solomon Islands, okay? They're going to start in Pearl Harbor. You're going to pay your transport costs one, two, three, four to Ellis Island, and then you're going to pay it again a second time, one, two, three, four to Nomia. Uh, the issue is the port capacity. The port, port capacity is 16 in Nomia. Uh, it's big enough to get a carrier group and some other ships there. Uh, now, Ellis Island is not. It's only got a stacking of two points, but stacking is not applied to the end of the deployment phase. So you can use it as an intermediate stop to get you where you want to go. All right. We have a different situation over here in Singapore. So let's assume that these guys survive what's coming and they're still there for the allied part of turn one. Well, we've got, the difference is that we have a bunch of air units in Saigon. They have an air zone of control all around. So these guys are starting in the air zone of control. What that does is that they only get to move one hex. They only get to move one hex. So they're really not going anywhere, okay? And so we don't have to worry so much about them uh, getting away. I don't, they're not going to get away. And probably even more important at this point is how units perform reaction move when they are within an air zone of control. And it's a, sim a similar thing. If they start within an air zone of control, even if they react, let's say you know, we're going to invade here in Brunei, their reaction is going to be limited to one hex. So if they're not starting with an enemy's air zone of control and they enter one, they get to move one more hex. But if they start the move in the enemy air zone of control, they get one hex period. So that means that we have no fear of these guys interfering with the invasion of Brunei or anywhere else. However, the same is not the case for the Dutchman or for the Perth. So we have to look out for that. And by rule, all of the ships in Pearl Harbor cannot react turn one. Likewise, also by rule, the Allies cannot invade anywhere turn one. So we, Japanese has no concerns about those things. And we now move up to the operational phase. So this is where we are no longer moving from a friendly place to a friendly place. We are now starting to engage the opposition. When air units and land units move out during the operational phase, they are considered to be at sea. They can go up to four hexes and they pay twice their normal cost to do so. So for example, a full strength air unit is gonna be a two point unit for transport costs. It's gonna cost twice that during the operations phase and is limited to four hex movement. Likewise, the land units, they're gonna cost double. So if you have an eight point land unit, going to be doing a landing, uh, going out to sea and landing somewhere for an invasion. It gets its four hex move, but it's going to cost 16 to do it. So right away you see how fast those transport points can disappear. And here is where we hit a big difference between the Allies and the Japanese. The Japanese must use oil 
to pay for naval units, naval units, not land units going out to sea, not air units going out to sea. They pay transport points. Japanese use oil to move their naval units in the operational phase. If they move one to four hexes, it's one times the transport costs printed on the unit. If it goes farther than that, it's one and a half times rounded up for the stack, not for the unit. So here we have a Japanese battleship that I moved up. Its cost is four. If it only moves four, it's gonna cost four points. If it moves farther than four, it's gonna cost six points, except in this case, I believe it's a slow, ponderous battleship limited to a four-point move. That would be that lower right-hand corner. So he's not moving farther than four. But if he was faster, the unit was faster, he could go beyond that, and then it would cost one and a half times, or six. This is for each and every unit that moves during the operation phase, each and every naval unit that moves during in the operations phase. So here you can see the oil disappearing rather quickly. So just how are we going to prosecute all these attacks that we say we want to do with all our little flame markers scattered about? Well, let's start with the fun one. Let's go to Pearl Harbor, okay? Uh, I've already set aside the units I want to send. Now, there is a rule for turn one. You get to designate one stack of naval units, and in that stack you get to uh, pay only one times the cost to send them. So you have a bit of a savings. I suppose they're saying, well, there's some reserve fuel that was used. So let's take a look. And here we have the Kirubutai that was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan at the start of the war, at least in this version of the war. We have what amounts to six aircraft carriers, the best Japan has, very, very fast ones and pretty fast ones. And we want to put one destroyer there, and there's a reason for that. The submarines, the American submarines, are suffering from a detriment of minus two on the first turn, but they get a plus one if there's no destroyers present, and the base to hit number is a five or six on a six-sided die. So we take off our shoes and socks and do the math, and we see if so long, so long as we have one destroyer in a task force, it is invulnerable to submarine attack on the first turn of the game, which is a good thing for the Kiro Batai. We don't want to have them sunk by submarines right away. In order to send uh, ships out during the operational phase, they must form a task force. And a task force is composed of a maximum of four naval units. And so here's the four that we have selected. Three carriers, one destroyer to keep the uh, submarines away. Unlike the other units we've seen so far, this is the strength of the air units. So this is four, eight, eleven points of air units, which translates into eleven attack dice rolling for fives and sixes or whatever whatever the case may be. There's some modifiers to that. So these guys are heading out to Pearl Harbor. They're going out past four hexes, but by rule for, uh, for the first turn of the game, they only pay the base cost. So they're gonna pay four, eight, 11, 12 oil points this time. 12 oil points and they're gonna show up at Pearl Harbor. And here we go with them showing up at Pearl Harbor. And in one swell foop, we decrease the oil tally for the Japanese from 60 to 48. That's got to hurt. The troops and destroyer unit over in Iwo Jima is going to go ahead and assault Wake Island. We have a base within two, and the base where the assaulting troops is originating from is within four of its target. This is going to cost double the transport points for the, uh, for the land unit, so it's going to cost four transport points, and it's going to cost one oil point for the destroyer group. And there we go at Wake Island. The land unit is considered to be still at sea at this point in time. And doing the math, we now have 47 oil points and 45 transport points. Next! Uh, we're going to go ahead and do this, this easy attack here over to the Gilberts. There's really nothing that can touch them, so that's an easy one. And as with the other one, this is going to cost four transport points and one oil. Bringing our total down to 41 transport points and 46 oil. Remember, right now we don't have any oil uh, hexes that, that have been taken, so as a, right now there's no new oil coming until we do that, so we'll get there. 
At truck we have uh, two destroyer groups and a heavy cruiser group and some troops that are ready to go to Rabaul. I think I'm going to leave one of the destroyer groups behind. I think this should be enough. The only guy that cause us, could cause us a problem is the Perth stationed in Australia. It could react. Its reaction range is half its speed, so eight halves to four. So he can interfere with guys landing within four hexes of him. And he can get to Rabaul. So I'm bringing a little bit, I want to bring in a little bit more. He's a light cruiser. I'm bringing, I'll bring a heavy cruiser and a destroyer as well as the troops. So that's going to be three more oil and four more transports. One, two, three oil takes us to 43. Transport one, two, three, four takes us to 37. And these guys are getting ready to, to land. Next, we have we have up here in the Marianas. Remember, we forward deployed these guys, and now we're going to use them. We have a destroyer and another heavy cruiser, along with a bigger land unit. And those guys are going to go invade Ley. I'm happy having a stronger unit here because we want to put early pressure on Port Moresby and having a nice four-point unit there may just be able to do that. At least it will cause the Americans to think about putting more troops there, okay? And they're kind of tight on, those, on troops to begin with. So putting pressure on them early, that will cost. Again, it is within uh, half of their speed. Their ship speed is eight on both of them. They're within four, so it's going to cost them times one. That's three oil points and eight transport points for that bad boy uh, uh, land unit that's coming. So that brings us down to 40 oil and 29 transport points. They're going fast. Next, from Palau, we're going to send the invasion force to Brunei, which will consist of a destroyer group, the Issei battleship group, and the Mogami heavy cruiser group, along with the two-point infantry unit that's going to take the place. Now, this is a heavier force, partly because, while we don't have to worry about the British intercepting because they are in an Erzak, the Dutchmen are not. Uh, these guys can actually go ahead and intercept us in Brunei. They're within four. No reason why they can't do it, because their speed is eight. So half their speed is their interception range. No Erzaks to stop them. They can do it. That's why we uh, forward deployed the Issei group so that hopefully this will be enough to convince them that maybe it's not a good idea to go into Brunei. And this will cost seven oil and four transport, taking our oil down to 33 and our transports down to 25. Next, from Formosa, we have to do the invasion. And there's no naval units around here to speak of. So we simply have a cruiser group, a heavy cruiser group, and a destroyer group. Remember, we want to send at least one destroyer with every uh, force that goes to sea so those submarines can't hit us on turn one. And we're going to invade Manila. Now, Manila is another special place. If you don't take uh, Singapore by turn four, it starts costing a point a turn, and likewise Manila starts costing you. So you, uh, you have to take this place. This is not an option. So these guys are going to go in. This is three oil points and 16, yes, count them, 16 transport points for this invasion force. So that would take our oil down to 30. We've now spent half our oil. We're down to nine transports. We started with 60, so we're burning through those transport points. The invasion force is now in place. However, I think we need more than this. This could win, but I think it's closer than you think. When it comes to the most important target on this whole map, in my estimation, which is this air unit. And the issue with that air unit is that it actually interrupts the flow of oil back to Japan. Oil is going to uh, need to hit a base every other hex that it travels. That's the supply line. 
to get oil back to Japan that doesn't get it there. You still got to pay for that, but you don't even get the opportunity to get it there if you don't have a supply line. And Airzox break supply lines. So if, once we take Brunei, we can trace to Saigon, we can trace to Hainan, and if this air unit is not here, we can trace to Formosa and on to Japan. But if that air unit's there, we have a big happy hex here, or a big unhappy hex here, that his air sock is hitting. There is nothing stopping it. That air unit has to go. Now, we do have a good force. We have four, uh, four air units here, eight points. There'll be long-range air attacks, so that will have to four dice attacking. That should do it, but I have seen it not do it, and this is kind of too important to play with. So, hello. I've got a light carrier with two aircraft. I've got a light carrier with two aircraft and a destroyer. Now, because they're originating from a separate base from the landing task force, these guys have to form a, form a separate task force, and it's generally a good idea to keep your carrier task forces separate from bombardment and or invasion task forces. So, these guys are going to form their own task force, and they are going to travel also over to Manila to provide further air support to this attack. And that's going to cost three more oil, to, to, to bring it down to 27. And we now have, we're going to have four land-based air hitting that air unit, plus an additional two sea-based air. Uh, if you want to play games, you can probably split off some of those to attack the, the ground unit, but uh, we'll think about that once we get to combat. Right now, we just got to get the planes there. I think six should be enough to put us on some uh, uh, firm footing uh, to make this attack do something. Now, we don't have to. We don't have to take the Philippines. We don't have to take the Philippines this turn, and we don't even have to damage that ground unit. But we do have to take out that air unit, so that will be the focus. Finally, we are going to be attacking the ships. At Singapore, and if they if they react out, the only place they can react to is Saigon. So it just makes it even better for us because then it's not long range. They're probably going to stay there. When a force reacts, it has to be able to react to where an enemy is. Okay, they don't have to be able to attack it, but there's got to be an enemy there. Uh, since the only place that is true is Saigon, that's the only place they can react to. Uh, because they're in an airzock, and that limits them to one hex movement, not the normal four. That they, that they would have. Even so, there's really, you know, where are they going to go? They can't go, they can't go back over here because there's no enemy units there. They got to react into a hex that has an enemy unit. So that is our attack setup for December 1941. Now we can go ahead and go on to the next phase. One last thing before we do that, we have the Tokyo Express marker from the optional rule that the campaign game recommends using. They list, I think, about three uh, optional rules they recommend for the Japanese and three more for the Allies. I do use them, and I do think that they add to the game. One of them is Tokyo Express. So what the Japanese can do is, in one, one task force that's out at sea, that consists of uh, cruisers and destroyers only, and plop this down on one of the one such stack, and what it does is it gives that stack first fire in any naval engagement. Normally it's simultaneous fire. We've got a battleship over at Brunei, so we can't put it there, but I'm going to put this in lay, because that's, you know, my the overall strategy I'm following from turn one is to pressure Port Moresby, and I don't want anything to happen to this particular task force should the Perth come out and try to do something. Uh, it's unlikely they'll be able to do it, but I want to make it even more unlikely that they're going to uh, want to try. And the next phase is the reaction phase. This is where the Americans get to react to what the Japanese have done. Now, by rule, the Americans in Pearl Harbor can't go anywhere. They're stuck in place. Uh, then there's this roving force that I put in the West Coast that has the one carrier. House rule, it's just going to go off someplace useless rather than have a chance of showing up at Pearl Harbor or Wake Island. I want to play a historically based scenario here as much as I can, so I don't want those weird things happening. So what better place to put them in December is on Christmas Island where they can, they can have nice luau's and stuff. 
the Perth is one of two groups and could actually try to uh, react and uh, to some positive effect. I don't think the most allied players would bite on this one because between the heavy cruiser and the destroyer, I'm thinking no. One of the optional rules is the long lance torpedo, and those destroyers are quite deadly. They get a plus on their die roll, and I think there's pluses just because it's turn one. So it would be, it would be really unlikely that the Perth would be able to win this naval engagement and stop these invasions, and re- really, really unlikely if they were to try where the Tokyo Express marker is. The Allies could also give it a try with the uh, the Netherlands uh, troops or Netherlands ships, which is a destroyer group and a light cruiser group stationed out here in Surabaya. They'd be going into the teeth of a battleship. They can only go four, and uh, the only place they can get to is there. They can't reach because of the impassable hex. They, uh, they can't get to these guys because this is impassable to see and they don't have enough t- uh, movement to go around it. So they are going to uh, try for Brunei if, Brunei if they do anything. Uh, this is a coin flip. Uh, I'm going to say that they're not going to do it because we're going to have plenty of stuff going on. I think most allied players would not do it, but uh, I'm going to leave them here for now. So we are not going to intercept. And as, and as I said, it makes no sense for the, for the British ships, uh, the Prince of Wales and its accompanying escorts to try to do anything. They're just going to take it right there. So there is no reaction that's going to happen in the reaction phase. I see we're running a little bit long, so I think I'm going to cut it off here. I'm going to package this up as part one of a two-part series. Part two will have the combat sequence for all of the battles that we've generated so far, as well as finishing out the turn uh, all the way to the end for the Japanese player. And then we'll talk a little bit about strategy that the Japanese can follow to continue the campaign on past turn one. To all my subscribers, I simply say thank you. And for those who have not subscribed, please support the channel by hitting the subscribe button. I'll have part two up in just a couple days. All the footage is shot, and so I just have to do the editing and put on the final touches, so it won't take long. But until then, this is Paul, the Oaken Knight, wishing everyone a pleasant evening.